All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Annie Hardison Moody, and I'm really um, glad that you all are here for this webinar on how faith communities can respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm really thankful that two of my colleagues have stepped in. Um, we asked them to do this a little over a week ago because we realized that we needed to have some additional content and support around the um, coronavirus and um, this uh, growing pandemic and to think with you all and to think with faith communities about how to respond. Um, and so how today is going to work um, is first I'm going to introduce our presenters and then they are going to do their presentations. Um, if you have questions during their presentations, if you would type those in the chat box, because we have a lot of participants, um, what we're going to do is ask you all to type your questions in the chat box. I'm going to record all of those questions, and then I will read your questions aloud during the Q&A portion, um, just so that we can keep everyone muted and um, reduce feedback. I'm sure everyone has been on a ton of Zoom calls lately, and um, so I think this will be the easiest way to make sure that we can um, hear everybody and hear our presenters. Um, so uh, that's how today is going to work. And again, I'm so grateful to Dr. Kirby and to Dr. Chapman for being with us. Um, and so let me introduce them now. Um, Dr. Ben Chapman is a professor and food safety extension specialist at NC State. Um, with the goal of less foodborne illness, his group designs, implements, and evaluates food safety strategies, messages, and media from farm to fork. Um, and Dr. Chapman, you might have seen his uh, work recently. He's been all over the news talking about the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on foodborne illnesses. And so we're really excited to have been here to talk about that work. And then um, Dr. Sarah Kirby um, is a professor and our Family Consumer Science Estate Program Leader, the Department Extension Leader, and an Extension Specialist in the Department of Agricultural and Human Sciences at NC State. Um, she also is the state coordinator for the Healthy Homes Partnership and is actively involved in educational programs related to preparation, response, and recovery after natural disasters. So she's going to share some of that work with us to think about uh, how faith communities can respond to this current pandemic. Um, so I'm going to mute everyone and um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Ben and Sarah to uh, start your presentations. Thank you all again so much for being here, and we're excited to have this as our first webinar of the Faithful Families uh, 2020 Virtual Summit. Thanks, Annie. I'll go ahead and go first, and then I'll, I'll let Ben follow me up because he's got some really great information that I think is going to be uh, particularly useful. Um, but I will start my screen share now, and we will begin. I was muted, so here, here we go. <laughs> I'll begin. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me, Annie, um, and to the rest of the Faithful Families team. It's always good to talk with you. Um, you guys do some amazing things in communities across this um, country, really. So um, thank you for having me. Um, today is a little bit different um, because we're, we're responding to a different kind of disaster, one that we're not particularly um, used to. But I did want to begin by doing um, a little check-in. I think one of the things that we've all been feeling um, right now is a little, little different. Whoops, let me go back. A little bit different. I'm going to start this poll. So if you will just give me a little bit um, uh, just in the chat box, if you just give me a, a star, um, one, two, three, four, five, you're feeling great or not so great. Um, yeah, I see we're, we've got a whole bunch of different, a whole lot of different feelings. Okay, almost all of you have had an opportunity. Give you two more, three more seconds and see what you what you have to say. All right, well, I'm gonna end it there. Um, so I think most of us are kind of kind of in this yellow, not not quite happy, not quite as sad as we could be. These are different times for us. Um, 
at least nobody's at one star yet, which is really, really sad. But we, we do have a lot of different feelings. Some days are good days, some days are bad days. And this might even fluctuate as we go along. And I think about, I think about you all being the leaders, um, either faith community leaders or educational leaders. And if you're feeling this way, um, then uh, chances are everybody is feeling this way. So those that you serve are feeling the same. And that's why the job that you have really is, is such a big one because you're, you're being asked to do some things perhaps that you haven't um, in the past. So know that you're not alone at least. The, the, the folks that are on this um, webinar with you are feeling some of those same things, but maybe together we can figure out how to, how to get through some of this. Um, one of the things I, I did want to talk about first was um, some information. As, as, as the role of a, a faith-based or a community leader, you really kind of have a, have a unique opportunity um, in this COVID-19 response. Um, you, you have an ability to address the potential concerns, fears, and anxieties of this virus. This is something new. This is something scary. Um, it's not isolated to any one part of the country or any one um, economic or um, educational or uh, backgrounds. It, it affects all of us. Um, and one of the things that you find in your uh, Faithful Families um, virtual summit materials is a, um, a bit of information from the Partnership Center. And this, is, this comes from the Partnership Center for Faith and um, Opportunity Initiatives. But one of the things that, that we can do as faith-based leaders and community leaders is really help to not only um, articulate those concerns, feel, fears, and anxieties, but help to, um, to alleviate some of those, help to manage some of that by, by promoting information that is helpful, information that is accurate and credible. And, and sometimes I think when people have information, even though the, the world may be scary, if you've got the right information at your fingertips, then, then you, you feel like you, you're given a little bit more control over your lives. Right now, I think we, we feel a tad bit out of control. I will think, it, think it's kind of interesting. I was listening to the um, COVID-19 virtual church summit recently online. Annie, Annie Hardison Moody shared that information with me and I was listening to Dr. Nicolette Lusant um, and she was talking about different things related to faith. And, and basically she said that the normal ways of doing things, of affirming things that we have in our various faiths um, actually can make outbreaks worse. We do know from the news for example, that, that some of um, the COVID-19 outbreaks have been traced back to religious services. So what we've had to do as, as um, community leaders and, and faith-based leaders is we've had to rethink some of our traditions and our, our ways of doing things, those rituals that, that we tend to hold on to, particularly in times um, that are stressful. So things like weddings and funerals no longer look the same. Um, we have some holy days coming up. That will be different. Um, you know, there's, there's very little, if any, passing of the cup or breaking of the bread or, you know, sharing meals together. Um, pilgrimages uh, may be coming up later in the summer. Um, those, those may be different. But all the ways that, that we tend to respond in our faith um, are all potential ways that we can actually um, spread the virus. So it's hard because sometimes it's, it's difficult, as, as Dr. Lusant said, it's difficult to separate the practice of faith from our faith. And that's kind of what, what faith-based communities are being asked to do by changing the way that they, that they interact. Um, I thought one of the most profound things that I saw recently was this, this picture of um, the Pope in St. Peter's Square. And as you know, if I'm not of the Catholic faith, but, but all of us are probably aware of it, that it's usually full whenever the Pope is there. And there he was by himself um, giving mass, giving a sermon uh, to an empty square. And so I think that that just sort of shows that our new normal is way different than our old normal. Um, so know that it's, it's affecting every religion, that, uh, every faith that you can think of. Um, but one of the things we also know, not only do our practices change, but the way we're going to respond to this disaster is different. 
um, it, re it requires a significantly different kind of response. If it were a flood or an earthquake or a hurricane, you know, we know what to do. We, we physically go to places and we provide things. We, we sit beside people and we listen to their stories. Um, we fix things. That's what we do. We try to put things back together and make people whole. Um, and in this disaster, we, we physically can't be next to other people. It is, it is much different. Um, and so what we have to do as faith-based communities and, and leaders is to think about different ways to respond um, to the disaster or to the crisis at hand. So really the job of, of, of faith-based groups is, is, is um, to follow guidance. Um, to think about restoring calm by reinforcing, you know, uh, precautionary or preventative practices or mitigation practices. That's our job. That's our role in this particular disaster. Um, we want to keep things from becoming worse. We can't prevent it from happening probably altogether, but we can help prevent it from making it worse. And so things from the CDC are important. The things from your various health departments or, or state um, government are important to follow. And so you need to follow the guidance that's given and you can help reinforce that guidance um, through your leadership and your communities. Also, I think it's very important to provide accurate information. Um, the Center for Disease Control has fantastic information about the coronavirus, and I'll put all of these in the chat box later so that you can go look at them. Um, also think about um, ways that we can protect and shield people by providing accurate information from some of our universities in the states that we are, are in. I happen to put up the one of my colleague who will be talking a little bit later, um, but we have significant resources on COVID-19. And we know that, that sources such as the CDC and sources from um, university professionals um, are going to be more accurate than something that you just might find on Facebook or somebody might tweet or, or you know, cut out, cut out of a, you know, some obscure publication. Um, the other thing I would say too is um, if you belong to a particular denomination or faith that those groups are also putting out um, significant pieces of information that you can rely on. You can also share information back to your denomination or your faith community um, by looking at the CDC or by looking at some of the information that is shared at um, through, through university sources. Um, also, as I mentioned, there are specific sources um, from the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that relate specifically to communities and faith-based organizations. Um, one of the things that I think is particularly valuable is this one about spread. So if there is no community spread, there are still things that you should do as a faith-based community. If there is minimal to moderate, what do you do? If there's substantial spread, what do you do? So all of these help provide guidance so that if you know what's happening and you have specific steps you can take, there's less opportunity for fear or, or um, anxiety. Um, I always think information is, you know, along with your scriptures, information is, is one of those things that, that can help provide um, um, for panic or help alleviate panic. So, you know, knowledge is key. You, you, you turn to your scriptures or your text for um, knowledge about dealing with trials. So that's the same thing you should do when you, when you have a trial such as this, is you turn to, to um, credible information. So um, as I mentioned earlier, land grant universities have all kinds of information. And so as, as leaders, you can educate, 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 and then educate some more. I don't think you can get enough education out there. I think sometimes people, People can't deal with it all at once, so putting it in small bits of information that they can um, metabolize and, 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 and actually sink in is helpful. There, there are so many different parts to this particular um, virus from, you know, what do you do if you're sick? How do you clean? What do I do about my food? What if I go to the grocery store? How do I handle all of this? And so being able to provide that education is important, and that's something that Ben will, will go over I think in a little bit um, after I'm finished. The other thing is, is this idea, it's not just, it's not just staying clean, but it's also this idea of, of what about, 
you know, or mental health. What do I do with my kids? How do I handle this, having my family around all the time? I've been home for almost, uh, well, almost three weeks. And uh, I have a, a pack of wild dogs who are really irritated with me because I am home all the time and I'm killing their vibe. They, they, they don't want me here. Um, and I think about, you know, people who are used to being away from their families, kids that are used to going to school, um, their fears about what might happen to grandma and grandpa. Um, you know, all of those things are things that are important. So, so also relying on your um, universities or your denomination for education related to mental health and, and, and dealing with um, the fears, not just the scientific fears, but those, those emotional things that, that happen to us. It's, it's, you know, Faithful Families is about you know, building on this connection of faith and health. And so this is, this is just another, another aspect of, of health beyond physical health. Mental health is important. And, and I think too, one of the things that's really important as communities of faith is this idea of connections. You know, faith, faith is really um, practiced alone. It's usually a, a corporate kind of thing. And so being able to keep connections with others in your faith community. And, you know, while we can't see people necessarily next to each other, we can't go to, to worship or go to a study or visit um, other members' homes, um, we can connect through emails or text messages. And we can even go old school and do phone trees. That's what we used to do before we had devices in our hands all the time. Um, one of the things that, that my community has done is something called an out card outreach. And we've done this a little bit differently where it isn't just adults sending messages to adults. Um, they've gotten children involved in writing messages and sending those to members of our, of our community. Um, because children, giving them an opportunity to participate is important and having that connection is important. Information on websites and social media and, and other technology is important. Um, one thing though that I, I did think about um, really carefully was I, I listened to Dr. Um, Pernessa Seal yesterday and she was talking about health, health equity and and um, some issues related to that. We also have to think about technology equity. So when you think about the people in, in your faith community or the people that you lead, do they all have access to um, technology? And if they don't, are there different ways, ways that you can reach out to members of that community, whether it's you know, sending them a newspaper prescription or, or dropping off a radio or subscription, not a prescription, but dropping off a radio or, or, or you know, magazines in, in some way, reaching out to them in a different way, letting them know that, that, that people are thinking of them and that, that um, you know, they're not alone, even though they might feel isolated because they, um, they don't have access to technology or perhaps even live alone. So, and then the other thing is, you know, think about who else might be in need outside of your community. So, you know, one thing we, we, we do need to take care of people that are within the community, but also people outside of, of those that we might um, practice our, our faith with. So first responders, what kinds of needs do they have? Vulnerable populations that may be outside of our, our, our particular congregation or our particular group. Um, so, you know, those that have lower incomes, those that don't have cars, those that don't have um, access, again, to technology, those kinds of things. Um, parents. Parents need help. I know. I don't have kids at home anymore, but um, I know that if I did, I would need lots and lots of help. So are there things that, that you can help with, whether it be face to, you know, not face to face, but via distance? Um, and who else? And of course, those that are quarantined. Um, but think about who else in your community may be in need at this time and, and come up, try to come up with some creative ways to, to reach out to them. And then because, whoops, sorry, because um, being a leader um, and, and especially being a faith leader, sometimes means that we put ourselves on the back burner and we think about others first. 
I want you to think about taking care of your own emotional health and your own physical health. Think about your body. What does it need to, to, to sustain itself? Eat right, exercise, get plenty of sleep. Um, connect with those you care about. We, um, we have family that doesn't live in the same state we do, so we have figured out how to connect with each other, um, in our case, using technology, but also just by sending letters to each other. Um, unwind, take breaks, stay informed, but be sure you unplug. Turn off that television from time to time. Don't look at every Twitter feed. Don't, don't listen to everything um, because it can be too overwhelming. And then if you need help, seek help. Um, it's important to recognize when it is too much for you. Um, one of the publications that I will also put in the chat box is a link to um, this taking care of your behavioral health from um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It gives you some tips on what to do when you're feeling overwhelmed because people of faith aren't immune to mental health or substance abuse issues at times like this. So make sure that you watch for issues in yourself um, and that you do what you can to um, take care of that. And then again, think of different ways of volunteering. So maybe you, maybe you aren't serving soup kitchen meals, but maybe you shop for somebody who needs to, to have food at their, at their home but can't go out. It's too scary for them to go out because they're older or they have some other sort of um, immune um, compromised, immunocompromised uh, situation. Think about donating to, to food pantries and, and food banks like you, like you might have in the past and collecting supplies for those individuals that, that might need help. Um, if you don't wanna do that, you can also think about gift cards. Gift cards are a great way of, of helping organizations or helping people who might not have an opportunity to, um, to take care of themselves or might have difficulty taking care of uh, all of their family's needs. I also encourage you all to look at the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster on their website. They have places um, where you can learn about how to volunteer, how to donate, um, how you can affiliate with existing organizations so that you can collaborate and partner with people who are already actively working. Um, I think because this is such a different kind of disaster, it's really difficult to know exactly what to do and, and how to help. And so this is a place where you can go and get information um, about that. You can also go to Volunteer Match, which has a um, remote or virtual volunteering um, matching program. So people who want to be involved can be. There's, there's a special place to, um, to check in for COVID-19 and volunteering remotely because we can't necessarily do it face-to-face. -face. Um, and then, you know, other thoughts that you all may have on helping, and this is something that we can share in the chat box and go back to if you'd like to, um, because I know that Ben um, has some things that he would like to share with you as well. But I think one of the things that's really different is how do we do this? How do we do this virtually? How do we do this from a distance when, when people are not supposed to interact with each other? Um, so creativity is, is going to be um, key. So that's, that's what I have for you. I will stop my share um, and see if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, Annie. I think that is great, Sarah, and we'll, we can wait till the end for some questions, but. Okay. Ben, I think you should be able to share your screen. Yeah, let me uh, figure out. Oh, no, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay, hang on, let's see. There you go. Let's see if that works. Yep. Perfect. Let's do this. Do that. Just a quick reminder while he's getting set up, if you all have questions, if you could put those in the chat box and we will um, ask those during the Q&A at the end. Thanks. All right. How's that look? Annie, everything looks good? It looks great. Okay. I think, yeah, if you want to do it in presentation mode, you can. I th uh, it doesn't matter. It, no, it looks great. Okay, cool. I think it is in presentation on my side. Um, 
Okay, so let me see. All right, we'll just go with this. So, um, and I, I apologize, um, Annie and, and all the participants, things, uh, as Sarah said, has, have been um, a little bit chaotic uh, in, in my world uh, over the last uh, three weeks or a month or so. Um, what, what I do is, is really um, kind of at the intersection of what things people are worried about when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 and the transmission of, of COVID-19. And, and so I've been, um, my, my group's been, been um, really working sort of around the clock on looking for the best available resources. Um, oops, resume share. Um, best available resources for, um, uh, for food safety um, and the really sort of at the at the forefront of questions um, that, that we've been receiving and, and where this fits in to um, uh, faith-based programs, faith-based communities is really just around how we operate in emergency food settings and how do we how do we essentially get people um, information and, and food and, and is food uh, a route for um, for risk of, of transmission. And so I'll, I'll give you, um, I, my goal here is really to, to just walk through a few slides to talk about some of the resources that we've developed, tell you a little bit about how we developed them. Um, but I, I'd really like to open it up for, for questions um, in the, um, as, you know, as we, as we go forward here. Um, let me try something else, sorry. Keep getting these alerts that my sharing is not working. How's that? That's perfect, yep. There we go. All right, so um, where, where we are right now, and again, this is evolving information and, and every day there's, there's additional science that, that comes out, but where we are right now is that um, the Center for Disease Control, FDA and USDA, which are really the federal agencies that are involved in anything related to food and food as a vehicle for, for illness um, are, are all um, echoing uh, messages that, that we also see in the scientific community that as of, as of right now, we really don't have any evidence whatsoever that food or food packaging are risk factors in getting COVID-19. Um, what, what we do know um, is that the, the biggest risk factor for the illness is person-to-person -person transmission. And, and so, so obviously that's why many of us um, and, and hopefully all of us are um, practicing social distancing, we're staying at home, we're away from others because our greatest risk is getting sick from someone else. Um, and, and not, not um, you know, not, not really just people who are ill. Um, we, we have a sense um, right now uh, that there are, um, as we look at sort of investigating clusters of illness, that there's also a, a risk factor of being around people who, who are infected but don't have symptoms or are asymptomatic, they will never develop symptoms, or are pre-symptomatic that they uh, are carrying the virus uh, but have not yet started uh, feeling respiratory uh, symptoms. But that's that's at the top. Those are the things that that we know are um, are risk factors. And so where where my groups really come in and the types of things that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks are really answering questions um, related to well, but what about food and, and why do we get sick from, from food from other pathogens and why isn't it um, the same for when it comes to COVID-19 and how can we be so sure um, about this um, and what do we know and what should we be doing even if we don't know what are some best practices that we can that we can focus on and so as Sarah has already mentioned I think that this is in the um, in the chat box as well um, we we have um, a, a large list of resources that, that we've developed 
Um, I'm going to highlight a few of them. This by no means are, are the only ones. And what we're adding daily and really trying to respond to are these, these types of questions and other um, uh, recommendations and myths that are out there about the control of, of the virus. And so um, to give you a sense uh, how we're developing these, we, we really start with CDC and FDA and USDA guidance. That guidance is very generic and, and really what I've just shared with you about food, no evidence of food or food packaging is, is really where that, where that information from the federal agencies stops. Um, what we've been doing is really trying to answer to our best ability as scientists why we don't believe that food is a source. And so that starts with the epidemiology of where these clusters get sick and that there aren't common food items um, associated with it. Or we would expect if food was a, was a source, we would expect that people that all shop at the same grocery store at different times would be sick. And that's not what we're seeing as we see these illnesses um, pop up. We also know that the virus itself, and this has to do with the biology of the virus, it doesn't really survive our gut system very well. Um, and, and in fact, the pH, the acidity in our stomach would, would um, uh, blow apart the protein coat that surrounds the virus. Um, and so that's, that's part, of, part of the answer as well. But, but we do want to talk a little bit about you know, things that, that people can do. So what we've been doing as we develop these materials is uh, we created a, a national panel of food safety and virology experts, people like me at a variety of um, universities across the US who we, we have questions and we're as a group really evaluating the science and as that changes every day, evaluating what we believe the, the right steps are. Um, and so we're, we're in contact like literally 50 or 60 times a day as we develop material, review it, make sure that we're all on the right, uh, on the same page with the best available information. Um, we, we've put these resources in flyer and social media formats, so they're shareable. So a flyer, like a PDF that someone could, could read and, and email, but also um, uh, images that, that are being used um, uh, to be shared through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram um, and, and other areas. Um, and then uh, we're in the midst of making sure that we have Spanish translations for all of our resources. Um, about 70% of them are, are translated right now. And we're also translating um, resources into um, Mandarin, Chinese, as well as uh, Vietnamese. Um, and so that we're, we're really, um, we're really uh, trying to make sure that we can share this information, sort of the best available science throughout, um, uh, you know, sort of all over the place. So some like, I guess, basic um, resources that we have are about cleaning and disinfection, what that means, what types of chemicals we should be using. Um, and, and again, you can follow along um, on the website, uh, but, but each of these, um, uh, pieces of material, we, we do talk through, this is what CDC is suggesting. Here is a list for more information to make sure that the disinfectants that you may have are on a list that we know are um, effective against coronaviruses in general. Um, and then we've got some information about, about hand washing. Really, um, and, and it sounds so basic and simple, but most of the risk reduction that we can do in our faith-based communities as we're um, you know, uh, helping distribute food as we're interacting with people. The biggest thing that we can do is, is hand washing um, as, as well as not being around people. And, and so um, but we're really trying to, to reinforce um, those messages. Um, something else that we've really talked about, and Sarah alluded to this, uh, is, is when you're in your community, preparing for an outbreak, thinking about exactly like, like Sarah mentioned, um, who needs to be involved in an emergency plan, who are helpful organizations, and, and right down to, you know, if I, if I have a question about, about food at our, at our church food pantry, who's the right person for me to call at the health department to ask, uh, you know, to ask that question so I get the best available guidance? Um, and so really revisiting, um, you know, this, this checklist uh, that, that we put together um, to make sure that, that we've got all these things in order as, as this outbreak evolves. Um, and and I, I would also highlight that 
that based on um, sort of the study of disease and especially the study of respiratory diseases, if we are able to, um, to do what we hope to do with social distancing and, and limit exposure in the upcoming months, we, we, we do expect, and I'll, I'll say this from the public health standpoint, we do expect to see a resurgence of this virus again in the fall as we do with, with viral um, uh, respiratory viruses. So, so, you know, although we may want to get through sort of what's happening now, also revisiting these materials as we get further into the summer and later in the fall um, about preparation is, is something that I would absolutely also um, suggest for, for your faith-based community. Um, probably the two biggest questions that we've been getting over the last week and a half are, are related to grocery store shopping and takeout food. You know, I think we've seen the change of um, uh, of social distancing, focusing on no no dining rooms. Uh, food is essential. We, uh, you know, I, I won't be, um, it, you know, it's not it's not a joke, but it's it's one of these. You we can't have a truer statement that we won't last very long if we don't have food. So we have to we have to get food through grocery shopping, takeout, um, curbside pickup, delivery. Um, as we think about limiting exposure to people, especially for our vulnerable populations. And so, so we really try to answer questions in a science-based way about, okay, so we have to, if, we, if I have to go to a grocery store, what can I do? Um, and, and really reminding um, you and also individuals in your community about hand sanitizer, using cart wipes, minimizing the amount of time that I'm in an environment with other people. Um, a lot of questions that I've received recently are, you know, is it better that I that I go in and go out multiple times for for two or three minutes, or should I have, you know, one big grocery shop once once a, a week? And and that's it's a complicated question. And the the real answer to that is whatever is the way that you will not be around people as much as possible. So it kind of depends on how you do your shopping, but it's the total amount of time being around others is, is really the, the risk factor. Um, uh, we've also developed material for takeout food um, and really talking through not just that we don't have any evidence that food has been a source of COVID-19 um, at all, but why that is and what happens in your body if you ingest coronavirus, as far as we, we understand based on evidence from, from other viruses. Um, and really trying to dispel some myths about the need to um, wipe down and spray any packaging of, of sanitizer and really focusing on, on hand washing as our, as our risk mitigation step. Um, the, other, the other two that, that I wanted to, uh, to highlight and end on, and then um, I think we'll have time to open things for, for questions for both uh, Dr. Kirby and I, um, but is this idea around food banks. And this is something um, uh, both from the receiving food and cleaning at food banks or food pantries, as well as um, ha uh, handling food. And, and really, um, this, th this is something that we've been working, with, um, working on across the state, but, but really reducing risk in, in thinking about the exact same measures of in a food bank or food pantry area, our biggest risk is transmission from person to person. So how can we create, change our approach a little bit to maybe say, people are gonna come get food, we want them to arrive and, and let's just get them to open their trunk or open the back of their car so I can put food in. So they don't need to get out and then interact with us and other people um, in, that, uh, in that setting. And that's kind of a, an ideal situation. Each individual bank, a food bank or pantry within, within your community really needs to look at how they're operating and try to figure out the best way to first of all, make sure that individuals who are sick aren't there. Secondly, encouraging hand washing um, for, for anybody who's a volunteer. Um, and, then, and then thirdly, thinking about protecting clients um, as well by reducing those, those interactions as much as possible. And then overall, highlighting the need for cleaning and disinfection um, uh, th throughout this entire process. As Sarah mentioned, and, and I, I, I know I've, I've seen it through social media and even in my own community re you know, recently, um, it's, it is somewhat unbelievable how quickly this, our, our world has changed and, and how different the 1st of March is to the 31st of March. Um, I want to caution all of us that that we are we are still at the early part of this. Um, this is not something that's that's going away. 
um, by Easter or, or in the next uh, uh, few weeks. Um, it's something that we need to remain vigilant on. And it's something that, that we, um, and as folks in uh, NC State Extension, we're, we're actively really trying to respond to, to questions and answers and get the material um, of, that is the sort of most science-based material in the, into, into people's hands so they can make the best decisions on how to protect themselves. Um, uh, we also, and I won't spend too much time on this, but we do also have materials on farmer's market and specifically on produce. And then the last thing that I'll highlight on produce because of, um, this is sort of another common question that I've, that I've heard is, should I um, wash my produce um, in, in soap and water or vinegar or dilute chlorine? And, and really the, um, you know, the science that, that we have um, on, on food safety in general, on coronaviruses and other foodborne viruses is that rinsing with water is the best and most effective way to, to reduce risk. Uh, and that risk being very, 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 very low in the first place, because like I mentioned, we don't anticipate that food is, is really a risk factor um, uh, currently, and we don't really have any reason to believe that that, that will change over time. Although it might, we, we just, with the data that we have in hand. So there are lots of like, um, I think alarming messages out there. Uh, and as someone who works in food safety, who works in virology, that, that, that I do this day in and day out, um, that, that information is, is not helpful nor, nor risk-based. And, and I really wanna focus on the things that we can do and, and just rinsing with water uh, when it comes to produce is, um, is an effective step. For more information, this is kind of my parting uh, info. We have lots of places that you can follow us. Um, whether it's on Facebook or on um, Twitter or on Instagram, we have accounts. They're all at Safe Plates FSIC, that's Safe Plates Food Safety Information Center. Um, or the link that we've put up uh, a couple of times, um, we update that literally daily. Usually two or three new resources are coming out um, each day. So, so please check back uh, if this is something that you're, that you're interested in. Um, and with that, I don't really have anything else. I'll uh, stop screen sharing. I think I, it's been stopped. Um, thank you, Annie. Uh, and uh, and you know, I, I you know think that Sarah and I are here to answer questions. Um, I'm Annie, I don't know what what the next direction that you want to take us in, but but please let us know. I have a couple of questions from the chat box, and then so we'll go through this first, and then if we have time, we can um, uh, get to some other questions. So. First, um, Liz had a question, how do we respond to people who recall that the um, initial causal information from China was related to eating foreign or exotic foods and animals? And I know, Ben, you addressed this a little bit with like the food concerns, but in thinking more broadly maybe about stigma and how people have kind of used or stigmatized people from China and Asia. Yeah, no, it's- How to it's, prevent uh, that. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, that, that's a wonderful question. It's a little bit outside of my area. I, I guess what I would combat the stigma, the stigma with is that we, we literally don't know. Um, we, we believe that, that almost the natural host for all coronaviruses is likely bats. Um, there are lots of places where people interact with bats. Um, in, you know, I think about in my own neighborhood, um, I, if I take my dog for a walk, as I do sort of every night at dusk right now, um, there are bats that are flying around. If there's bats, there's bat poop, um, and there's a, a chance to interact there. Not, and, and I don't want to say that as like, so you should all be afraid of walking your dog. That's, that's not the, the message. The message is we, we literally don't know all of the, the science and the intricacies of, of where this specific virus came from or in fact, many other viruses when it comes to, to pandemics. And it is not singular to one ethnic, um, uh, you know, racial um, aspect of food. In this case, geography based on where, where this pandemic emerged is, is, you know, is likely, um, you know, I think that, that China is, is a place that we start seeing illnesses, but we don't really know anything more than that. And, and as a scientist, I, 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 need, um, I need us all to think about data and causation and, and the fact that, that at, you know, at this point, when we're really trying to control person-to-person -person, um, uh, transmission, the, the initial start of it 
that argument to me is is silly. Um, it it literally doesn't matter right now on how how this started. We we have to continue to be vigilant and and keep people off beaches and and away from um, from uh, office buildings and, and 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 in general, really doing our best to 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 stop the transmission. And Andy, I feel like I like kind of wishy wash answered your question because because I don't know really how to battle stigma. Um, but but I, I think that that it is it is well too early to to point a, fi a scientific finger at at, at at rumor. I think science is a good way to fight stigma. That's a good that's a good start. Um, so a next question is um, also for Ben. You spoke about a resurgence in the fall. Can you speak to if you think this will be a virus like chickenpox that once you get it you're immune or does, is the research showing that it's more like the flu where you need a vaccine every year? So I, I would normally respond to this um, question with the like hands up emoji of I don't know. Um, and hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Um, literally, we are 75 days into identifying this virus. Um, uh, I, if, I, if I compare to what I do on a normal COVID-19, non-COVID-19 day, um, where I look at salmonella in, in meat and poultry or um, E. coli, pathogenic E. coli in, in romaine lettuce, we have decades and decades of science to, to help us understand how we control those pathogens. And, and we still don't know a lot about it. And we are literally less than three months into this. So um, we, we don't know. Um, and I, and I, uncertainty can lead to further anxiety. I, I understand that, but I think it's also um, important for us to, to as, a, as someone who does risk communication, for us to, to recognize and, and sort of say, we're, we're actively, not, not me, but the public health world is actively trying to answer that question. Um, the, the fact that there are vaccines in trial currently is promising. Um, we're, we're too early to really know what our um, immunity, acquired immunity will look like, what our seasonality will look like. The real, like just to step back a little bit, the real need for us in, in the whole concept of flattening the curve, which I'm sure many of you have heard that, that term, the goal there is not, and I, I saw some, some uh, um, frustrating comments in my own social media feed from friends just today on this, the goal there is not to limit the total number of illnesses that happen. The people that get sick are gonna get sick over, over time. The goal is to limit how quickly that happens. And so I, I would expect that based on what we know from influenza and what we've seen with SARS and MERS, other respiratory illnesses, there is a seasonality to it. SARS still exists, it was something that that uh, uh, um, sort of emerged in 2002. There are still SARS cases today. It go, it, it, there's there is some level of acquired immunity, but we literally don't know. And I and I I, I want to be I want to be careful in in, in that because I, I don't want I really don't want people to um, to panic about it. But I do think it's it's important to say this is something that science is really looking at, and we just don't have a really good answer for it today. That would, that would probably follow with the next question about um, recurrent infection that we, we don't know. know a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We don't, we don't know. Um, and, and uh, yeah, and, 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 but, but if, if it is similar to influenza, we do have reoccurring um, uh, influenza um, uh, um, uh, infection and, and illnesses. And that's why the vaccine is ch changes every year is because the uh, because of the, the virus um, virus's ability to to evolve um, the the issue that we have here is that um, the uh, coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is different from from influenza the the mechanism for evolution is a little bit different and we don't we literally don't know yet <laughs> it's very it's really it's gonna be really easy for me to do the Q and A because I think I'm just gonna say I don't know. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm just joking. Yeah. No. Well, and I think, um, yeah, I think that's what makes the work that you do as a public scientist really uh, amazing and also really difficult because this is such an emerging thing. And so we appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions um, and saying you don't know because sometimes 
that's better than pass. I mean, always that's better than passing along false information. Um, which related to that, um, Viola has a question, and then I'm going to loop back to a question sure. before that, which is a health equity one, about how trustworthy you think reports are, you've seen in the chat, coming out from China, yeah. that there's a turnaround and that the government has lifted restrictions. I, <laughs> this, I, I, I don't know. Um, so, and, and, and I, I, and I uh, but let me give you a little justification on that. I'm, I'm not extremely familiar with the reporting process of um, other um, governments, other than a handful of governments that have very similar systems of public health reporting compared to us in the U.S. And so I would say that, that um, Canada, the U.S., the U.K., Australia, Germany, Italy, um, you know, Italy, we've, we've talked a lot about Italy around this, this outbreak. Um, I, I, I would say I have, I have a lot of confidence in, in reports because I know that those, um, the, those public health systems have a history of, of being good um, stewards of public science um, and controlling other, other outbreaks. Um, I, I wouldn't just say that this is a, um, a concern related to China whatsoever. I think that there are many developing um, uh, uh, health systems throughout the world that, um, that, that either aren't great or don't have the resources to, to count. Um, or get a handle on cases, or have other reasons for not reporting um, illnesses. Uh, and and I and and literally, I don't I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you what I what I would trust on on anything that's international is what the WHO is saying, the World Health Organization, and and they have been extremely careful in, in their communications. They update daily um, of of not um, sort of defining, hey, we've got it beat in China, everything is good. And in fact, um, if we look at uh, uh, South Korea as, a, as an example, there was a flattening of the curve um, and then a resurgence of, of some illnesses um, there. So, so I, would, I would really look towards the World Health Organization on, on that. That's helpful. Um, so to loop back to the, the health equity question, which a focus of our summit this week has been on health equity. Um, can you speak to rinsing the, you know, calls for rinsing produce with water, especially in communities where they don't have safe drinking water? Yeah. Uh, so, so this is, this is what, what we often refer to in the food safety world as a risk risk trade off. So, so rinsing, I, I would look at my likelihood that my produce has coronavirus of any kind on it is extremely low. Based on the epidemiology, based on what we know about how we're controlling um, individuals around food, um, good practices related to hand washing and, and food safety in that food system, all of those hurdles really help us say, you know what, at the end of this, yes, there is a chance, like I can describe a theoretical way that a virus can get on that produce, the, but we don't really have any, any evidence, or um, if, we, if we follow all the things that we, that we are doing um, you know, in non-COVID-19 times, we, we're reducing those risks along the way. So if I then take that, that very, very, very low risk tomato and put it into water that has uh, concerns from a uh, safety issue, I am, I'm essentially potentially adding more risk to it. And, 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 and there's no good answer to this. It, it really comes down to what's the worst risk? Is it, if I, if I can look at uh, the safety of water from, from these areas and address that either through um, uh, water treatment systems that are personal, uh, boiling, um, you know, using iodine tablets, that's really gonna help reduce that, that risk risk trade-off. But if I don't have any of that available to me, um, I don't, I, like, and, and it's a very personal risk question of what's worse. Uh, is it um, hepatitis A, norovirus, E. coli, salmonella from water versus the COVID-19, which is really, really low risk that it's there in the first place? I, I, don't, I, I, don't, have a, I don't have a good answer um, for that, but I wouldn't want to say everything needs to get rinsed regardless of the water um, uh, the safety of the water because of this issue that's really pertinent in our mind right now in COVID-19 that could lead to another risk potential. Most of the things like that, I've, I, how I've been answering a lot of these questions, it's not so much on 
on, on safety of water. But when someone is like, all right, is it safer to get hot takeout foods versus cold takeout foods? Well, hot probably, we don't have a lot of data. Heat's probably better for the, like it's, it'll kill the virus. But if the risk, if you're not doing anything that's any riskier by heating it up, so, so go ahead. But if somehow we said, um, we're like this, I might be doing something that's riskier. It's, it, it makes it, a, it's a hard, it's a hard an question to answer because I don't want to expose somebody to something else. And, and Ben, I would also say that with some of those contaminants, um, because I see there's a question later about water contaminated with lead and using water filters. If you can use a filter to filter out the lead, then that makes good sense. But the, the other potential um, for reducing exposure is to, to, you know, run your water and flush the lead out or, um, you know, like I said, using a water filter. So think about those other practices that you can do to, to reduce the contaminants before you actually use the water. Because there is some potential, depending on what that contaminant might be, to reduce yeah. um, the potential for. Yep, yep, yep. Well, and I think that goes back to what, Sarah, you were saying in your presentation about how, you know, this, uh, how to think about this pandemic in light of how our health equity concerns. And I think that times of crisis, and um, this is certainly one, really lay bare um, where disparities exist and how they exist. And um, it's also a time, you know, I used to study like war and, and crisis. And one of the things that um, theorists of conflict look at, and I think it's relevant here when you're thinking about crisis is, these are also times of opportunity to change systems. And if, we, if, if, if we're kind of laying things bare, it's our opportunity to make them different. And so maybe that's kind of our word of hope at the end is like, as we, as we start to see as a society where there are gaps, where there are people who are most vulnerable or where there are people who are um, feeling the pain of this pandemic more so than others, what does it look like to recreate systems in such a way that um, we all have access to clean water. We all have access to the health care that we need. We all have access right. to the things that we need to be healthy. Um, so, Yeah, and, and these things, they're so um, tied up within each other. They're, it's, you can't parse those, those things out. Right. And often, like, you know, one of the things that, I, that I, I talk about a lot when it comes to food safety in the world that I live in all the time, it is, it, food safety is a, is a discussion for, first of all, countries where where water is safe, right? Like, or in not just countries, but but locations where water is safe. Like, you can't worry about food safety if you don't have safe water. Um, and and then secondly, it is a rich rich developed country question where nutrition has already been taken care of. Where and and I know we we obviously have our um, have tons of hunger and food disparity issues in in the U.S. But, it, but we can work on food safety because we have a mechanism to work on that. But in, in other areas of the world where they're, they're, we don't even have that, the infrastructure to, to deal with, with hunger, food safety, like I have no place there. <laughs> like food safety, if, we, if I have to worry about like food, that it, like no food, but it's safe versus food that is unsafe, it's gonna be food that's unsafe. Like there's no, it's not a, that it, it's not a, a question um, whatsoever. I, I see the question about, do we think it's likely that equal as access will occur during this crisis? And, you know, I think that's a, that's a good question. The answer is probably no. However, that doesn't mean you should give up hope because I think about some of the disasters that we've had in the past where, where there have been particularly vulnerable populations um, and we have identified those groups. I think about Katrina and people not being able to evacuate. Some, some policies have changed as a result of that, is it perfect? No. Is it is it equal? No. But it can be better. And so I think sometimes when we have a crisis like this, a pandemic, which is something we don't normally have, it opens up opportunities because we we see even more um, the disparity between the populations out there. So I I, I would I would sort of be on Annie's side with that idea that, of trying to find some optimism in, in the worst of the situation. Yeah. 
Well, and we are at the end of our time. So I think that's a good place to end. And I'm so grateful to Ben and Sarah for being with us for this hour. It has been very helpful and um, helped to relieve some of my own anxieties, both because of thinking about like, what is the science, but also what are ways that we can respond and that religious communities can respond um, to this crisis and this pandemic. And I'm just grateful for you all. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, for those of you who are joining throughout the week with the summit, there's lots of additional resources, including the links to the food safety portal in today's newsletter. Um, and look for tomorrow's newsletter for our webinar that will be at the same time at 1 p.m. Um, on uh, mental health and uh, faith. And that will be with Dr. Janae Avent Harris. And she is going to also talk about COVID-19 and the mental health concerns that faith communities are seeing. So thank you both again. And we really appreciate you all being a part of this Faithful Families Virtual Summit. Y'all take care. Thanks for the Thank advice. you. Bye.